Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dmitry Grozadinsky. I'm the executive director of the Geneva Trade Platform, which is based at the Center for Trade and Economic Integration here at the Graduate Institute of Geneva. It is my honor and my privilege to welcome all of you and to welcome our keynote speaker for today, Ambassador Tai, the United States Trade Representative. Welcome. We are absolutely honored to host this important speech. I think a critical speech given how long it's been since we have seen a USTR walk the halls of Geneva. Um, and judging, judging, by, judging by the way that registrations were ticking up faster than we could confirm them, uh, a speech that's attracted quite a lot of interest. Uh, with the ambassador today is our very own Professor Richard Baldwin, a professor of international economics at the Graduate Institute, and actually our co-strategic director for the Geneva Trade Platform. Um, it is my job to simply give some thanks, uh, give some housekeeping notes, and then get the hell out of the way. So I will endeavor to do that. Um, by way of thanks, let me first thank, of course, the ambassador, but also USTR State and the team here at the US Mission, who have been phenomenal in both trusting us and working with us to get this event done. Let me thank the technical team here, as I won't have an opportunity to do that after the event. So I will tempt fate and assume it will all go well. Uh, thank you so much for all of your hard work. This stuff doesn't just happen. And let me thank all of you, those of you watching at home, and those of you with us here today um, for putting so much faith in an organization that didn't exist except in dreams 18 months ago. Um, that clears our things. So now just the housekeeping in terms of how this event will run. Uh, once I am finally off the stage, I will invite the ambassador to deliver her keynote remarks. Uh, afterwards, she will join Professor Baldwin for a discussion and a, a little bit of back and forth before we open the floor to questions from the floor and from our Zoom audience. Uh, for those of you joining us in the room today, uh, the procedure for asking questions is a, a slight awkward because of COVID restrictions. We would ask you to put your hand up and when Professor Baldwin calls on you, there are ushers on the right side and I think they'll be in the center lane uh, which will have a mic for you. If you could just move over and join them and they will hold the mic for you while you ask the question. We apologize for that. It is simply a, a matter of hygiene and COVID. Um, on that note, if you could all please, as you are doing, keep your masks on. We would greatly appreciate that for the duration of the event, except, of course, when you're asking a question, at which point you can take it off. For those of you joining us on Zoom, you can ask your questions at any time via the Q&A box. So that's not the chat, that's the button that says Q&A at the bottom. And when Professor Baldwin calls for questions from the internet, I will read them out and the ambassador and the moderator can then address them. Um, and that, apart from uh, uh, reminding you to turn your cell phones on to silent um, and to remind the students who are here that immediately after the session, they can come to the front of the stage and take some photos with the ambassador, who's graciously agreed to share her time, is, um, is all I have to say. So with no further ado than that, let me thank the ambassador. Um, a, one of my colleagues is going to wipe down these mics, and then they are all yours. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you to Dimitri and Richard, the Geneva Trade Platform and the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies for hosting me today and putting together this event. It is really a pleasure to be back in Geneva. I have looked forward to making this trip since becoming the United States Trade Representative in March, and I am so grateful to be here with all of you today. I spent a lot of time in this city earlier in my career representing the United States government with pride before the World Trade Organization. I appreciate the importance of this institution and I respect the dedication of representing the 164 members as well as the WTO's institutional staff working on behalf of the membership. I also want to thank Do Director General Dr. Ngozi for leading this organization through a most difficult and challenging year. Let me begin by affirming the United States' continued commitment to the WTO. The Biden-Harris administration believes that trade and the WTO can be a force for good that encourages a race to the top and addresses global challenges as they arise. The Marrakesh Declaration and Agreement on which the WTO is founded begins with the recognition that trade 
should raise living standards, ensure full employment, pursue sustainable development, and protect and preserve the environment. We believe that refocusing on these goals can help bring a shared prosperity to all. For some time, there's been a growing sense that the conversations in places like Geneva are not grounded in the lived experiences of working people. For years, we have seen protests outside WTO ministerial conferences about issues like workers' rights, job loss, environmental degradation, and climate change as tensions around globalization have increased. We all know that trade is essential to a functioning global economy. But we must ask ourselves, how do we improve trade rules to protect our planet and address widening inequality and increasing economic insecurity? Today, I want to discuss the United States vision for how we can work together to make the WTO relevant to the needs of regular people. We have an opportunity at the upcoming 12th Ministerial Conference, or MC12, to demonstrate exactly that. Throughout the pandemic, the WTO rules have kept global trade flowing and fostered transparency on measures taken by countries to respond to the crisis. But many times sensitive issues still require our attention. We can use the upcoming ministerial to deliver results on achievable outcomes. The pandemic has placed tremendous strain on people's health and livelihoods around the world. The WTO can show that it is capable of effectively addressing a global challenge like COVID-19 and helping the world to build back better. There are several trade and health proposals that should be able to achieve consensus in the next month and a half. I announced in May that the United States supports text-based discussions on a waiver of intellectual property rights for COVID-19 vaccines. The TRIPS Council discussions have not been easy and members are still divided on this issue. The discussions make certain governments and stakeholders uncomfortable, but we must confront our discomfort if we are going to prove that during a pandemic, it is not business as usual in Geneva. The United States is also working on a draft ministerial decision aimed at strengthening resiliency and preparedness through trade facilitation. Our proposal would improve the sharing of information, experiences, and lessons from COVID-19 responses to help border agencies respond in future crises. It is important that our work on trade and health does not end at MC12. After all, the pandemic will not be over in December, and it will not be the last public health crisis that we encounter. In the next six weeks, we also have an opportunity to conclude the two decades long fisheries subsidies negotiations and show that the WTO can promote sustainable development. We want to continue working with members to bridge existing gaps in the negotiations. To this end, the United States is sharing options to respond to developing countries' request for flexibilities. We believe that any agreement must establish effective disciplines that promote sustainability. It must also address the prevalence of forced labor on fishing vessels. We call on all members to support these goals. I recognize that discussing these complex issues during a pandemic is hard. Despite this challenge, we can reach meaningful outcomes and set ourselves up for candid and productive long-term conversations on reforming the WTO. As I mentioned earlier, the reality of the institution today does not match the ambition of its goals. Every trade minister that I've heard from has expressed the view that the WTO needs reform. The organization has rightfully been accused of existing in a bubble, insulated from reality and slow to recognize global developments. That must change. We are used to talking to each other a lot. We need to start actually 
listening to each other. We also must include new voices, find new approaches to problems, and move past the old paradigms we have been using for the last 25 years. We need to look beyond simple dichotomies like liberalization versus protectionism or developed versus developing. Let's create shared solutions that increase economic security. By working together and engaging differently, the WTO can be an organization that empowers workers, protects the environment, and promotes equitable development. Our reform efforts can start with the monitoring function. In committees, members deliberate issues and monitor compliance with the agreements. This important work is a unique and underappreciated asset of the WTO. Increasingly, however, members are not responding meaningfully to concerns with their trade measures. The root of this problem is a lack of political will but committee procedures can be updated to improve monitoring work. And at MC12, ministers can direct each committee to review and to improve its rules. It is also essential to bring vitality back to the WTO's negotiating function. We have not concluded a fully multilateral trade agreement since 2013. A key stumbling block is doubt that negotiations lead to rules that benefit or apply to everyone. But we know that negotiations only succeed when there is real give and take. We can successfully reform the negotiating pillar if we create a more flexible WTO, change the way we approach problems collectively, improve transparency and inclusiveness, and restore the deliberative function of the organization. Over the past quarter century, WTO members have also discovered that they can get around the hard part of diplomacy and negotiation by securing new rules through litigation. Dispute settlement was never intended to supplant negotiations. The reform of these two core WTO functions is intimately linked. The objective of the dispute settlement system is to facilitate mutually agreed solutions between members. Over time, dispute settlement has become synonymous with litigation, litigation that is prolonged, expensive, and contentious. Consider the history of the system. It started as a quasi-diplomatic, quasi-legal proceeding for presenting arguments over differing interpretations of WTO rules. A typical panel or appellate body report in the early days was 20 or 30 pages. 20 years later, reports for some of the largest cases have exceeded a thousand pages. They symbolize what the system has become, unwieldy and bureaucratic. The United States is familiar with large and bitterly fought WTO cases. Earlier this year, we negotiated frameworks with the European Union and the United Kingdom to settle the large civil aircraft cases that started in 2004. We invoked and exhausted every procedure available. And along the way, we created strains and pressures that distorted the development of the dispute settlement system. With the benefit of hindsight, we can now ask, is a system that requires 16 years to find a solution fully functioning? This process is so complicated and expensive that it is out of reach for many, perhaps the majority of members. Reforming dispute settlement is not about restoring the appellate body for its own sake or going back to the way it used to be. It is about revitalizing the agency of members to secure acceptable resolutions. A functioning dispute settlement system, however structured, would provide confidence that the system is fair members would be more motivated to negotiate new rules. 
let's not prejudge what a reformed system would look like. While we have already started working with some members, I want to hear from others about how we can move forward. Reforming the three pillars of the WTO requires a commitment to transparency. Strengthening transparency will improve our ability to monitor compliance, to negotiate rules, and to resolve our disputes. I began these remarks with an affirmation of commitment. I'd like to conclude with an affirmation of optimism. I am optimistic that we can and will take advantage of this moment of reflection. In reading over the Marrakesh Agreement's opening lines, I was struck by the founding members' resolve to develop a more viable and durable multilateral trading system. These words are just as relevant today as they were then. We still need to work together to achieve a more viable and durable multilateral trading system. It is easy to get distracted by the areas where we may not see eye to eye, but in conversations with my counterparts, I hear many more areas of agreement than disagreement. We all recognize the importance of the WTO and we all want it to succeed. We understand the value of a forum where we can propose ideas to improve multilateral trade rules. We should harness these efforts to promote a fairer, more inclusive global economy. WTO members are capable of forging consensus on difficult, complicated issues. It's never been easy, but we've done it before and we can do it again. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Congratulations, Ambassador. That was a great speech. Uh, as a believer in the multilateral trading system, it was music to my ears to hear the USTR, trade minister of the largest economy in the world, be optimistic about the WTO, to point to the WTO rules as one of the heroes of the pandemic, not the villains, as a way of creating solutions to the challenges we all face, to being committed to the WTO's continued relevance and importance, and to be engaged in making the WTO a place where solutions are developed and adopted for the benefit of people, not just a place to come and say no or delay things. As unfortunately you pointed out, it has been a little bit. And I also want to say that it was an innovative speech because you were suggesting that the WTO rules could be used to address the great challenges we all face in the 21st century, rising inequality, economic insecurity, climate change, not just the traditional trade issues, but the WTO being some place which helps save lives, not just livelihoods, that helps rescue the planet from the climate disaster we potentially face and to bring a mitigation to the rising inequality that's creating political strife throughout the world. To break out of the bubble, if you will, to think out of the box. And it was not just nice words. You mentioned trade and health. The WTO's role was a convening body, a negotiating body, a monitoring body, and a dispute settlement body. And above all, it was a speech that made me believe that the Biden-Harris administration views the WTO in a very different way than the Trump administration. For that, I thank you very much. Now, that was my little comment on your comment, uh, your remarks. What I do like to, would like to do is push you a tiny bit further on some of the points you made. And um, you, I, you're gonna have to hold this thing up. So first of all, um, would you agree with what I said that we should view, we the multilateral community should view this as a speech setting out a clear difference 
between the Biden-Harris administration and the Trump administration as far as multilateral trade is concerned. Well, let me frame it a different way, which is um, thank you for welcoming me here. My pleasure. Um, I do feel a particular personal investment in the WTO, having cut my teeth as a trade policy professional, uh, you know, in the hearing or in the meeting rooms at the WTO. Um, I think that, um, uh, you know, let me answer your question this way. The Biden-Harris administration is committed to multilateral organizations like the WTO. Um, we were here at the beginning. We are here now. Um, uh, we are a part of the fabric, um, and uh, um, we need to be a part of the solution. And there are so many challenges facing uh, the world today. Um, the sense of uh, economic insecurity, the uh, widening uh, inequality gaps, um, uh, and frankly, a lot of the challenges that we're facing today require the collectivity of deliberation and action, uh, COVID-19, climate change, just to name two uh, obvious ones. Um, so I think that the WTO has a relevance. The challenge for us is to unlock the energy that I think that uh, WTO members felt um, a lot of in the early years that has waned over the middle years. How do we tap into that? And that really is the core of uh, this desire um, to start a uh, real reform conversation and to get folks back at the table to talk through, um, in a very honest way, their diagnosis of the disappointments that they've experienced, but also to really draw out uh, where they see potential uh, for their continued participation in this organization. Thank you very much for that. And uh, I, I think it's important to note that we all appreciate that you came to Geneva to make this speech. I mean, you came for other reasons too, but uh, that, that's already sending a strong signal. And you've laid out kind of a rich menu or agenda of reform, uh, of innovation and action. But um, reading the newspapers, we see that, that the Biden administration's a little busy at home with a number of things, fixing a few potholes here and there, <laughs> health systems, security, childcare, et cetera. Does, does the administration have the headspace for also advancing WTO reform? Um, well, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, I just gave a speech outlining the administration's vision. So uh, absolutely, I don't think um, I don't think anybody uh, considers that this administration lacks ambition. And I think that that is exactly what this moment in our shared economic history requires, which is ambition and vision, um, and a and a really uh, positive vision at that for uh, the future uh, for all of us. All right, thank you. So I also, um, partly in your speech, but also in, in other speeches you've given, um, introduced a few words that we, we're not really that familiar with, mm -hmm. economic insecurity, mm -hmm. worker-centric. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you see the WTO or the multilateral trading system more broadly contributing to this? I mean, how would that work? How can the WTO help advance either of those things? Well, um, two uh, responses to um, your observation that these words feel a little bit new in the trade community. The first one is um, the terminology might be new, but I think that um, the sentiment is, uh, I, I imagine, familiar to everyone, especially in this particular moment. Um, in terms of economic security, I think um, having gone through now uh, a year and a half of um, a global pandemic, um, I think that we've all been rocked by a sense that, um, you know, um, uh, the, the global economy uh, feels particularly fragile right now. Uh, in terms of worker centrism, it's um, for us um, uh, starting with the question uh, as we approach trade policy, whether we are formulating it or executing it um, or, um, you know, in whatever form, um, <clears throat> who are these policies intended to benefit and are these policies benefiting? fitting our people and our workers. With respect to the WTO, which is a really good question, that's why I keep coming back to the Marrakesh Agreement. It is a founding document of the WTO, and it makes clear in its opening lines that the WTO is here as a trade institution and that the trade that we are all um, working on and promoting is not the end in itself, but a means to an end to serve the interests of 
people to uh, raise the standards of living, to uh, increase prosperity. So I think that in a way, what we are trying to do is to say, hey, everyone, wake up in this particular moment that we're in. Uh, now, I think about 27 years into the WTO's history, let's go back to the roots of the WTO. And that is where we're going to find our strength. Thank, thank you, yeah. And I think uh, Dr. Ngozi, she, her, her, her uh, tagline is, trade for people right. and uh, so I think we're, we're, we have That's the right leader for this moment of broadening out what the WTO and making it part of the solution for us for the great challenges. Now, I want to ask you one other question that sort of um, connects a speech you made about 10 days ago in Washington and a speech you just made here in Geneva. Mm -hmm. So in the speech of, which laid out the uh, issues between, with China and the United States, I mean one thing I think we took out of that speech, and I think everybody agrees with, is the two largest economies in this world have to get along. So what we are looking for is an interface. Neither economy, each economy is too big to think that there's gonna be some change fundamental. We need an interface. Mm -hmm. Now, my question is, uh, from the speech you gave in Washington, it seemed largely a bilateral thing. Mm -hmm. And here you're in WTO, and I'm asking whether you think the WTO has any role to play mm -hmm. in finding the interface that we must find to make make sure that the world economy goes on uh, as in the benefit in the benefit of everybody. Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, absolutely. I mean, I think that one of the um, uh, assets uh, of the multilateral trade system and um, the reason why it is so valuable is the fact that uh, its, um, its base of membership is so expansive, 164 member economies. Uh, that's not everybody in the world, but is getting awfully close. Mm. Um, and so uh, in terms of um, the need for the two largest economies in the world uh, to be able to coexist, to be able to compete, um, and the impacts, knowing that that has impacts on everybody, yes, I think the WTO and the multilateral system has a very important role to play. But I'll just say that, you know, it isn't these two aspects of the bilateral relationship and the multilateral relationship are not mutually exclusive. Right, we engage at the WTO, and um, we have our roles to play at the WTO. There are the conversations we need to have in this context, but we also we also need to be pursuing an understanding bilaterally between uh, these two economies, um, and it's about uh, bringing all tools to bear. Uh, I think I was quite um, uh, honest uh, in the earlier speech as well about our disappointments in um, the track that we've pursued with China and the results that we have gotten from um, uh, the uh, approach that we've taken in the past and the need for us to find a new way of engaging uh, and competing with China. Um, so, you know, I'll just come back to the point that um, uh, all available tools, all available channels, we need to exercise in order to um, uh, uh, promote the interests of our economy, in order to um, uh, um, coexist in the world economy because um, it does impact all of us. Thank you very much for that. So I'll just ask uh, one more question and then we'll go to the floor. So uh, get your questions ready Why I blather on for a little while here. Um, now you laid out a long list of reforms that, uh, and as you mentioned, I think everybody at the WTO realizes that the WTO needs a fresh lick of paint. Mm -hmm. You know, the last time they did the rules, I think we used uh, floppy disks to uh, store our uh, files and things like that. There were no cell phones. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, could you suggest some priorities mm -hmm. or some timelines or maybe a process mm -hmm. Uh, what would a reform process look like? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, you know, you say it's a long list of priorities, but uh, I think I, you know, tagged the three um, pillars of the WTO. And the intention is really to say that um, we need to approach this question of WTO reform and the spirit of reform in a holistic way. Right, each piece is interrelated. There's a there is an institutional logic to the way that we had set up the WTO that we need to address. Um, so I wouldn't say that it is long. I would say that we have intentionally uh, 
brought to the conversation a desire to be um, uh, comprehensive and to look at the WTO as a whole. Uh, the other aspect of it is this: um, I could I could tag for you, you know, these specifics or you know um, these wishes about the timeline, but I think that the key to making the WTO work, the key to why the WTO doesn't quite feel like it works right now, is um, the fact that um, it is an organization with a very broad base of membership and stakeholders, and that if you are going to earnestly and sincerely talk about reform and undertake this process, um, we need to be inclusive about how we approach the conversation for reform so that we are not cutting out anyone who will have a voice and who will frankly have a vote, right? That's a consensus-based organization. Everyone's got a veto. Um, and so, um, you know, let me leave it there in terms of the way we've laid out um, the uh, reform discussion is intentionally designed to be welcoming to the membership to really um, uh, invest in uh, this conversation that I think that we can all benefit from. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, there is actually a first question. Um, it was going to be from Gabrielle Morso, one, uh, one of the famous lawyers here, but she is indisposed. Uh, I think she broke her leg or something oh, no. terribly, but at least it's not COVID, right? <laughs> um, so Mahesh Sugam from the Graduate Institute is going to ask the first question. Okay. Here we go. Here's your mic. Good afternoon, Ambassador Tai, and welcome to Geneva. Uh, I work with the Graduate Institute at the Forum for Trade, Environment, and Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, my question is, there is a growing recognition of the need for the trading system to be supportive of environmental, climate, and sustainability goals. How likely is it that the U.S. will join the growing group of WTO members supporting ministerial statements at MC12 aiming to bolster multilateral cooperation on the topics of environmental sustainability, plastic pollution, and fossil fuel subsidy reform. Thank you. So um, these are uh, specific, specific statements that are up at MC12, yes? Yes, okay. Um, well, uh, we are um, uh, we are working towards MC12. In fact, um, uh, for these last couple of weeks, I feel like I've really been getting my MC12 workout. Um, <laughs> it's almost like preparing for a marathon, right? You gotta have to work up your miles. Um, and uh, um, those are um, uh, topics uh, that are uh, absolutely relevant to the needs of our economy and our people. Um, and we are, uh, we are working through uh, the MC12 agenda right now. Thank you very much. Okay, there's a question here, please. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Tai. Could you come oh, okay. yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you. My name is Chang Hua Lo uh, from Taiwan. Uh, my question uh, is about the leadership of the United States mm -hmm. uh, in the WTO. Mm -hmm. uh, you've uh, just given us very clear message, and I thought uh, that uh, should be exciting. Uh, to a lot of people here, uh, and quite a number of values have been mentioned also, for instance, uh, the protection of labor and, and the possible prohibition of forced labor and, and things like that. Uh, you also mentioned about collectivity, uh, consensus that uh, require uh, memberships to, to, to agree, but uh, the UN United States is not uh, merely a member, an ordinary member, it is the biggest member uh, in the WTO. I wonder uh, how could the United States play uh, some kind of active role in leading uh, to make these uh, important values, for instance, uh, to eliminate uh, forced labor, uh, to make it happen uh, before or at the MC12, because uh, the time is uh, very limited uh, to MC12. There are so many things uh, to, to do. Uh, so basically, uh, what could be the US role in helping others to achieve consensus on so many uh, extremely difficult issues? Thank you so much. 
Thank you. You know, um, I'm struck in these um, uh, conversations um, in Geneva and around the, um, uh, the topic of the WTO, uh, the number of times people invoke the term U.S. leadership. Um, and, you know, I, I, I appreciate you building it out a little bit more. We are just one of 164, uh, but we are the largest of the 164. Uh, sometimes I think that means that uh, we are the biggest target in the 164. <laughs> sometimes, uh, sometimes in terms of building consensus, uh, if we say something, uh, we're the last person who needs to be saying it because the moment we say it, the weather 163 go, mm, I'm not sure that that's a good idea. So um, you ask a really good question because uh, we we are we are committed to the WTO and wanting the WTO to be more effective. And frankly, I think yeah, every WTO member is faced with the challenge of the way that this organization is structured, um, how can you be influential and how can you build coalitions? How can you build towards consensus? And I would just say that we as the United States um, work on that as well. Um, but that I think it is a question that we all ask ourselves. And um, it really is, uh, it really is um, uh, issue specific. And frankly, the reason why um, our representatives here in Geneva are so important to us is that they're the ones who need to be reading the room and who need to be, um, uh, you know, they're on the front lines of establishing the relationships and the communication uh, that's going to be required to build towards that consensus. On the forced labor um, issue that you just mentioned, um, uh, we have introduced in the conversation on fisheries um, the, the, the fact that forced labor is extremely prevalent uh, in, the, in the fisheries industry, especially on distant water uh, fishing vessels. Um, and we raise it as um, uh, um, uh, a focus of bringing the WTO and trade policy back to thinking through the impacts on um, uh, working people, <clears throat> uh, but also on sustainability. The fisheries negotiations are about sustainability of fish stocks, but also the sustainability of um, the people who make their living. Uh, in this industry. Um, and so far, I will tell you that not a single trade minister I've spoken to has told me that um, they are for forced labor in the fisheries sector. And so I am, I, am, I am encouraged by that, and I am hopeful that we will get consensus on this particular issue. Thank you for the question. Thank you very much. So I have a, st a student here from the Graduate Institute right over there. Uh, hi, uh, thank you, um, Ambassador Tai, and also thank you, Professor Baldwin. Um, so oh, um, my last name is Wan, and I'm from Taiwan, and I'm so a student at the Graduate Institute. And so Biden administration has been saying that their priority now is the Build Back Better agenda, like recovering the U.S. economy. But at the same time, they also say they 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 will become the supporter of the multinational multinational relations, especially in multinational trade system. So um, my question is, um, do, like, do you think in what kind of circumstances or do you have a, like, a specific time frame that U.S. will um, become fully engaged in trade system again or put trade as their priority? Thank you. Well, um is literally my job to work on US trade policy. And I have been really busy. So I, from my perspective, it is the top priority of the administration because that's what I spend uh, all my time thinking about and working on uh, as well as uh, for my entire agency. So um, uh, I thank you for paying such close attention to um, uh, the Biden administration's priorities and the work it is a lot that we have on our plate, um, but uh, um, the world needs a lot of work. And um, I think it is uh, important for us uh, to demonstrate our commitment um, and to really um, um, uh, be working extra, extra hard. Thank you. Dimitri, do we have, uh, just one second, I wanna get somebody, there's about two or 300 people online. So Dimitri, do we have a question? Uh, 
Hopefully not from somebody from Taiwan. <laughs> uh, unsurprisingly, uh, we do have some questions online. Um, and I don't believe either Simon Lester or Henry Gao are, are Taiwanese. Um, so this is, these are really two part questions, both along the same lines of the legal system. Uh, so we've received a number of questions asking uh, whether the US plans to move on the appellate body, what the conditions required to end the, um, to end the ban on new, new appellate body uh, judges, justices. Um, and so that was one strand of questions. But then a related question from Simon Lester, I think, is moving away from the appellate body. You, uh, you worked on panels uh, here in Geneva. Um, he was saying, and you mentioned that some of these cases take a long time and aren't working. So he was wondering if there is anything you can suggest, anything you saw to make panels work faster and work better in the US estimation. Thank you. Okay, so it's um, two questions. The first one specifically on the appellate body, the second one a little bit broader about the dispute settlement uh, system and how to make it more efficient. So um, on the first question, um, let me just say this. It is my hope that as part of this reform effort, we can bring a different energy to our negotiations. And instead of my slapping down a full-on proposal that I've dialed up to about 250 because I know that over the course of working through 164 members, you know, it's going to get like moved quite a bit from where we're starting. Instead of, instead of starting out that way, what I would like to do is start with the conversations, the talking to and the listening to each other in terms of um, uh, how the dispute settlement system, the whole thing, can serve the interests of members better. Uh, and I've given you some examples in the speech today in terms of where um, the dispute settlement system uh, has fallen flat in our estimation. Uh, but I can also point you to, and I don't think anybody wants me to do this, um, you know, reams of uh, documentation, uh, papers, statements that the United States has made over the course of 15 years and three different administrations where we were saying to the members of the WTO, we have concerns with the way the dispute settlement system is functioning functioning, and we think that there needs to be a course correction. And frankly, I think that over the course of those 15 years, <clears throat> not enough members listened. And so I want to take that lesson in this moment of reform to say, if you will listen to us, we will listen to you. And let's start the reform process from there. So with respect to the, um, uh, the, the, the panel uh, question, the only thing I would add there is that uh, the panel process does take a while. Um, it's very laborious. Um, it can be quite expensive uh, if you've got outside lawyers working for you. And I think that the issue is not how to make it faster, but how to create more opportunities for the members to come together and be incentivized to solve the problem. Because in every dispute settlement case, when you play it out to the end, you've gone through every appeal and you've gone to the arbitration for your um, suspension of concessions, the point is not to punish each other. The point at the end of all of this is to create the conditions for the two members to come together to find an accommodation because we are all WTO members. And so if there are ways that we can incentivize those political moments of conversation sooner, I think that that would be a worthy goal. Thank you very much. I just, I can't help but commenting that I don't think Bob Leitziger would have given the same answer to that question. But uh, <laughs> there was a question here, please. Thank you. The, the, the mic will come over. She, she's supposed to hold it just to, so she, she, she holds it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you a lot. I'm very optimistic, like Professor Baldwin, about your speech. Marvelous. I will make, I'll pose some questions that are very specific. Feel free to answer or not to answer. First, is the uh, trade facilitation ministerial decision draft proposed by the US? If you could comment on it. Second, if you can uh, consider about joining the GSI on MISME and also on investment facilitation. And the fourth, is it possible any out, uh, outcome, result outcome in, a, in agriculture for MC12? That's it. 
Thank you. C could you identify yourself just? I'm Secretary Alexander from the Brazilian Mission. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, let me think through your questions. You put it so diplomatically, you gave me the option of not answering. <laughs> but, but since you were so nice about it, I feel like I have to I have to answer something. But I think you asked, asked me three questions, right? One was on the JSIs, one was on agriculture, and the first one was? Trade, trade facilitation. OK, comment on the paper. Well, um, let me just uh, wrap uh, my answer in all of this, also because I'm seeing the flags up in terms of <laughs> the amount of time that I have left, and I want to be responsive. Um, I think that all of these issues are uh, important ones, and I know that each one of them um, is um, uh, has a number of WTO members um, that are invested in it. And because of that, these are all issues that we are looking at closely in terms of the run-up to MC12, but also in in terms of how to define the work that we all will do together after MC12. So uh, thank you for raising all of them. Um, and I just want to assure you um, that uh, I know what you're talking about on each one. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, we, are, uh, we are looking at each of those closely. Thank you very much. OK, we got a question here. Hi, Ambassador. Thank you for being here. Thank you, for thank Professor. You for um, my question is, we now understand the Biden's administration dedication to the WTO, but since your last public endorsement of the TRIPS waiver, a near silence has taken place from your office. Has the commitment you once made wavered? It's a good use of the word waiver and waiver, spelled differently. <laughs> No, um, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, it's something that we continue to work on um, and think about um, uh, and because it is so important. So um, I guess from the outside, it might look like silence, um, but I, I want everyone to know um, that the Biden administration's embrace and endorsement of the TRIPS waiver and the waiver proponents is uh, about our commitment to uh, the global COVID response and about the need to address what we are hearing from so many WTO members, which is that um, we need more production of vaccines and we need a more equitable distribution of those vaccines. And while we are making progress collectively, there's still a lot more progress that we need to make. And I, I wanna put in context the endorsement of the waiver um, uh, with the overall effort that the Biden administration is making in terms of, I think uh, over 1 billion doses uh, committed uh, the uh, continual delivery of doses. Um, to your question specifically, because this is a Geneva crowd, and um, you know, I say this with the utmost affection, um, that we are all trade nerds here. Um, uh, on the TRIPS waiver, uh, I think that um, uh, the challenge is, um, how do you get consensus through the WTO so that the WTO can look at the issue of intellectual property uh, rules and where they can be modified during the pandemic to facilitate increased production and equi equ more equitable distribution. And that's something that we remain dedicated to. And this may be uh, the case of, you know, the duck on the pond, where from the outside, you think the duck is just sitting there hanging out, but underneath the surface, the duck's legs are going very, very fast. And um, uh, it, it is, it is such an important issue at this time because of its uh, potential impact um, on a uh, positive impact uh, on the lives of people. So um, I thank you for that question and giving me the opportunity um, to respond. Thank you. So we have one minute left. So I'm going to uh, use my role as chair and ask the last question, a quick one, hard one. Uh, Biden administ Biden Harris administration seems really committed to climate change, the climate rescue, acknowledging it as an emergency, as I think we all uh, can agree now. Um, but how is trade going to play a role in that? So it seems a little bit div divorced the the treatment of climate and then the treatment of trade. Do do you view trade as providing, or how can trade provide an important pillar for what I'd like to call the climate rescue? 
Um, I think that um, um, absolutely there is a role for trade to play. I think that it is not just trade as a tool. I think that there are a number of policy areas um, that can be activated. Um, and I think that uh, there is a lot of energy at the WTO, um, but that we are all we are all working through exactly this question, mm. which is um, how to harness the trade tools that we have, where we can build out. And again, I think you know one of the challenges with respect to climate um, that matches up with the challenge of the WTO is it is a collective, it is a collective crisis that we're facing that requires a collective action. And so, um, you know, in some ways, um, as hard as it is going to be, it is kind of a perfect challenge for the WTO. Thank you very much. So with that, all I can do is thank the ambassador for sharing your time with us for demonstrating the U.S.'s commitment and optimism. I haven't heard optimism in WTO said in the same sentence in a long time. Uh, and I want to thank the participants and the people who made this possible, the people online. So let's all put our hands together for a great, great event. Thank you. Thanks to all of you.